And so our look back at classic gaming television has brought us kicking and screaming into the late 90s. You know, PlayStation, Double Lives, getting a kebab after a boozy night out with the lads, and then going back to the flat to play FIFA or Wipeout. That sort of shit. The time when gaming actually was sort of with it, in a sense anyways. More accurately, what had happened was that while 16 bits were aimed more at children and young teenagers, Sony had switched gears and aimed more at students, young adults, and the like. Gaming got more adult, more edgy, more all that sort of stuff that makes marketing people come. I mean, a lot of that stuff is pretty damn cringeworthy now. Look back at any random issue of the official PlayStation magazine, and you'll see enough laddish, low slung denim copy to make your skin crawl. But it was pretty successful. And while we did kinda sorta have the internet now, we didn't exactly have YouTube, so there was still a place for gaming on TV. But things had to change. The challenges of Games Master weren't gonna fly anymore. And so Channel 4 would set about commissioning a whole new type of gaming show, aimed at the new PlayStation generation. Why skirt around with double entendres when you can just go straight down Route 1? First off, we're going to look at the rather intriguing Bits, a gaming show that's wholly different from anything else we've seen, and indeed quite different from most of what we are going to see. But when it comes to how games were actually treated on the TV, it was kind of influential. Now, the origins of Bits actually came from another Channel 4 late night review show which started around 1998 or so, an irreverent little thing called Vits, which rounded up all the latest video and DVD releases. The show did spend plenty of time covering the chosen flicks in detail and what have you, but wasn't afraid of adding comedy and the like into the mix, with it even having something of a plot. It was an alternative show. If you think of Channel 4's almighty spaced as real life, then this is sort of the show that Tim and Daisy would watch happily, the sort of thing that would be described as being very popular with students. Vids was made by Ideal World Productions, headed up by none other than Muriel Gray of the Tube fame, and this same company would go on to make Bits. In short, they made a version of Vids only with video games. Like Vids, Bits would be part of Channel 4's Four Later Strand, which was home to all sorts of shows that were very popular with students. Ugh, how I loathe that phrase. Let's just say that they shared schedule space with shows like Eurotrash and move on. There was a slight bit of bet hedging. Bits also had a morning edition, which would be the same show only with all the swear words and that taken out. Back in 1999 though, you couldn't put on a show unless there was something wholly different and edgy about it, and such was the case with Bits, in a way. Now, bad influence aside, all the shows we've seen so far have a very blokey air. They're largely for boys, and boys are largely in front of the camera. No criticism or anything, that's just the way that they were made, and who they were marketed towards. The same was largely true of near enough all review shows, or near enough anything that was seen to be dealing with technology once the 80s rolled around. Bits decided not to go down that route. The show was presented and written in full by a team of three women, not a man in sight. Said women were American tech writer and presenter and now doctor Alex Kwiatkowski, consultant and marketing bod Claudia Trimday, and Emily Newton Dunn, who'd done various things in the industry and still does. Claudia would leave after the first series and would be replaced by TV presenter, cult actress, horror and games lover Emily Booth. They were described in some press circles as the Charlie's Angels of video games, but there's not really all that much of a gimmick behind it, at least first off, aside from literally it's three women hosting a games show. So with that in mind, we move to the show itself. There's no big studio or anything like that this time. Most of the action in bits takes place in a flat, so you get the impression that they're all flatmates or whatever. You know, just like you. There's the odd outdoor set in here and there, and plenty of screwing around with the format, but generally, this is it. If Games Master had £10,000 per episode when it first started out, I'm not sure if this even had £1,000 per episode. Cheap though it may be, it does some nice things with the limitations that it has, and some of the little skits and settings are genuinely funny. I wouldn't go so far as to compare it in quality to the almighty Adam and Joe show, but it's of the same ilk. With no challenges and the like, you get a good bunch of reviews, at least three in-depth ones in every show, plus a little roundup. In the first series, these reviews are, as it goes, very good indeed. 
Of the three, Alex is probably my favourite. She always seems to be the most informative one to listen to, whilst still being entertaining, even when covering something as typically uninteresting as Evil Zone. Still, there's not one with any of them, and when Booth replaced Claudio in Series 2, she fit right in, generally coming across as the most energetic of the three. The skits for the reviews can be, well, kind of intriguing. I don't think Games Master would have ever done a review of Hitman Codename 47 where Emily casually tells you about the game while dissolving a recently dead body in a bathroom, let's just say that. As the show went on, the skits got ever more creative and in your face, but I don't know, the reviews themselves kind of flagged a little. Watching some of the episodes from the fourth series, it feels a bit like there's not much opinion about the game, almost as if they're flat out reading from press releases. Too many exclusives that would be out months from now, not enough games that were actually in the shops. All that said, the program is kind of fun to watch despite all of that. Bits on the whole is kind of an it is what it is show. This is all relative, of course, it's never going to be classic TV in any sense of the word, but it's not bad for old games TV. The nostalgia portion of the show isn't quite as strong as Games Master. I mean, it depends on how much of an appetite you have for Dutch angles, early noughties student decor, and a time when presenters would openly use the fuck word in a review programme. The burly blokes beat the shit out of each other. Suffer from the big car small dick syndrome. Blair Rich Rustin Pa is out to buy now. I can see your butt. This wascally bastard will push Alice into the oncoming headlights of harm and then bugger off down his hole. And it can be quite in your face too. It's fair to say that Bits didn't exactly treat its intended audience with respect, although this can be said for near enough any late 90s, early noughties alternative programme. In the ever-evolving sub-dom relationship between viewer and television set, Bits and other shows like it were most certainly dom, playing up the nerd angle no end. It's not a bad watch on the whole, but it perhaps just lacks a little something to make it special. Maybe by the end it did get pushed a bit too much like, hey, it's girls with you in video games, for whatever reason. Make it too much of a gimmick and suddenly you get an older, sadder audience while watching with a box of Kleenex in one hand and a cock in the other. Bits quietly faded away in 2001, and there's not a whole lot of trace of it on YouTube, mostly episodes from the first and the fourth series. Of these, the first series episodes are by far the better. The show struck a nice balance between at points being genuinely funny, and actually having probably the most detailed review content we'd yet seen on a gaming TV show. Bits is the first time that any show would actually somewhat nail that problem. The later episodes are still kind of alright though, with the presenters being much more into their stride, but it really does lose the balance quite a lot. Next up we have a rather short-lived show that's somewhat related to bits called Fun Bandits. This would be Channel 4's replacement for said show, coming out not too long after. Question is, which of the three bits folks do you pick to host it? Booth would perhaps be the obvious choice if you were looking for high energy and the like. Emily could have been an outsider as a not too bad all rounder, but in the end the job went to Alex, the more serious one of the three with the white girl persona and general touch of wickedness. Alex Kotoski would host the show with. <laughs> oh boy. If you want a host that has an aura of early noughties crap TV nostalgia, well, I present to you a certain Mr. Ian Lee. Now, it should be said immediately that nowadays Ian Lee is a thoroughly solid chap. He does odd jobs here and there, he writes a fine monthly column for Retro Gamer, and his love of games is unquestionable. In many respects, he's quite a lot like Dominic Diamond. At the time, though, his reputation was somewhat less sound. Ian Lee first came to note on Channel 4's 11 o'clock show in 1998, a satirical late night show that could best be described as, well, edgy. A style of show that Channel 4 had cultivated since the days of the word and the like, with young men going from near the knuckle to shaving it off with a chainsaw, were talking make jokes about Jill Dando's death three days after she was killed sort of thing. In retrospect, the show was quite important, launching the careers of several people who'd gone on to be quite successful in the 2000s, in particular Ricky Gervais and Sacha Baron Cohen, whose Ali G persona was popularised on the show. At the time, the show was very much Marmite, loved by its audience, but hated, and I really do mean hated, by everyone else. It was certainly, as we say, edgy, because that's basically the only word that would describe the programme at the time, with a whole shit ton of controversial jokes and the like, just that a lot of the time they weren't actually all that funny. 
Ian Lee was the main host of the show throughout its one, and it seems like Channel 4 were pushing him a bit at the time. They'd always been searching for a new Chris Evans, and at one point it seemed like Ian Lee was going to get the nod, appearing in a fair bit of stuff around the start of the new millennium. With all that said, a move into games TV seems like an odd step for someone who could well have been Channel 4's new darling. A late night special interest show like Fun Bandits wouldn't exactly do much to further your career now, would it? But then Ian Lee had had previous. He hosted a one-off documentary for Channel 4 called Fun Candy in 2000, where he interviewed some of gaming's pioneers, took them on and lauded his victories over them. It was a mixed bag, but kind of okay watching. My feeling though is that Channel 4 were perhaps willing to give Ian Lee a bit of legroom, and his move into this show was inspired by his genuine love for games and what have you. It's just that people didn't really see it that way back then. The 11 o'clock show was still very much in the memory, and the presence of Ian Lee was greeted with general distrust. Fair? Not fair? That's kind of up to you. Still, Fun Bandits had a bit of baggage, and the question was whether or not it could overcome that. The long and short of it is that it couldn't really. Fun Bandits is kind of a shit show that feels like a lessery one of bits, with most of the same attitude attached, only even more so. The oh my god it's hurting my eyes white background doesn't help much either. But the whole tone of it just seems so forced. You're watching Fun Bandits, the antidote for SAD bastards everywhere. I get the impression that neither Alex nor Ian wanted to call it the show for SAD bastards everywhere, or insert a fuck after each and every word, but there they are, because it's 2000. And one going on 2002. And in return, nothing, not a fun there are some odd bits of goodness. The first episode takes a rather massive detour when Ian suddenly throws in a section on the BBC Micro, chucking in some of the best games for an old system, hitting on Micro Live, even going into how the machine handled sprites and all sorts, which is then dismissed somewhat quickly because most old games are boring. There's features on things like the upcoming Xbox and whatnot that bits kind of lacked, but everything feels like it's out of sync with each other, and there doesn't seem to be all that much chemistry between Ian and Alex, like neither of them want to be there. It sort of makes me think of an adult version of Bad Influence, only much worse to be honest. And sometimes the reviews are just kind of bollocks. It sets off an unappealing tone from the outset, and it doesn't really change. Watching just about any episode of this again was a major chore. Plus, Fun Bandits didn't last all that long. There were two series of it, one in 2001 and one in 2002, and then the programme was scrapped after just 13 episodes. Not necessarily something that was going to stick in the memory, and not worthy of a whole lot of coverage. Maybe it could have something, but this was about when the oh-so-edgy early naughty style was getting majorly tired. And help, to be honest, treating your audience with total disrespect, being alternately condescending and insulting towards them, wasn't really something that was going to fly. And in the end it ended up setting another much dimmer path for gaming TV going forward. You've all just got back from the pub, ain't ya? You've had a kebab, you've had six pints, that's literally verbatim. Friday, it's quite late in the evening, which means you've probably had a kebab and between one or six pints of beer, sir. So you're quite ready for thumb banding. And we're up for some Gran Turismo, yeah? Oh, what, you actually care about the stuff that's been shown here? <laughs> what a geeky, sad bastard. Kinda confusing, no? It kinda sorta worked when Bits did it, for a little bit anyways, before it got annoying. But yeah, we'll be seeing more of this sort of thing. It didn't even work all that well when Dominic Diamond started doing it later on in Games Masters 1. But anyway, where are they now? Well, Alex went more and more into tech and got a PhD. A few years ago she hosted a fairly well received documentary called The Virtual Revolution, which was kinda cool. She's generally not on TV all that much, but can be found on various tech based things. She's good at what she does. Ian Lee never quite became the new Chris Evans, although he would still host some stuff here and there. His most major gig after this was landing the morning breakfast slot on Channel 4's Wise in 2003. However, this was long after the show had already debuted as a disappointing, desperate to be down with it replacement for C4's previous flagship, The Big Breakfast. The whole thing had already died on its arse, and your boy here wasn't exactly going to be white in a sinking ship. He would stay with the show until its inevitable cancellation later that year. Nowadays he has fingers in a few pies, but mostly sticks to radio, where he started out, along with the odd bit of print and panel appearances. And as for Channel 4, the previous innovators when it came to gaming TV? Well, this is the last time they touch it, I'm afraid. So really, it can be said that these new types of game review shows didn't work out. 
Fun Bandits came off a lot worse than Bits, that's for sure, but both of them kind of fell down. Why was that? And why did they take that rather sneery, aggressive towards their fanbase tone that they did? To answer that, we have to look a little at the history of review programmes in general. It stinks. Now, before the late 90s or so, review programmes mostly took the tone of something like, I don't know, the film series with Barry Norman. Relaxed, thoroughly non-confrontational, informative, and quite deferent towards their subject matter. For a much better example, naturally you'd go over the pond and look at Siskel and Ebert at the movies, which crackled thanks to the pair's wit, debate, and friendly rivalry. When they disagreed with each other, it made for highly compelling television. Still, the audience for such shows tended to curve quite old, and such shows would not be suited towards other younger forms of media, like silly videos, mainstream music, or video games. So shows like these two and Vids took a different approach, taking out the deference towards the subject matter and replacing it with irreverent humour and the like. For the best example of such a show, look no further than another Channel 4 creation, the cult classic Pop World. Pop World ran in a morning Saturday slot back in the early noughties, aimed at children and teens but displaying a beautiful subversion, the sort of show where the hosts were more interested in their guests' favourite chocolate bars than whatever record they currently had to push, sometimes much to the chagrin of said guest or their labels. Britney Spears, these are your big ones. Okay. Have you ever licked a battery? Licked a battery? No. It was a wonderful show, and it helped make a bona fide comedy star out of one of its hosts, Simon Amstel. And it worked because it felt so very much outside of the media it covered. Indeed, it felt like a show that the music industry would prefer didn't exist at all. And so Bits and Fun Bandits tried to take a somewhat similar approach. The trouble was... Well, the video game industry doesn't have much in the way of starts, does it? Something like Pop World or Charlie Brooker's Screen Wipe has absolutely no end of tangible people that it can target who are going to take the whole shivan too seriously, who are a bit too up themselves, or who are just ripe for jibes and jokes in general. The games industry doesn't. It's so much more faceless. I mean, how many times could you take the piss out of, I don't know, Peter Molyneux? Is there even anything to take the piss out of when it comes to Shigsy Miyamoto? Those are two of the absolute most famous people in gaming, and they're still not exactly well known outside of the gaming world. I mean, more people would probably recognise Brian Bello from Big Brother than they would Hideo Kojima. So when no such target exists, the default target becomes the fans. Gamers having a particular stereotypical image, perhaps more so than, I don't know, a big music fan. And so these shows attack not necessarily gamers, but the stereotypical image of gamers. Directly insulting your audience though and painting it with that brush kinda comes with a lot of problems. It comes off at best as sneering, it comes off as confusing when you actually want to display love to the subject matter, and at worst it comes off as plain self-hatred. It's pretty hard to win the full approval of an audience that you're attacking, and who outside of the video gaming world is going to be interested anyway? In the end, the main trouble with shows like Bits and Fun Bandits was that the industry itself just wasn't built to support them, which perhaps goes some way to explaining why these shows are just about the last time we see any game in TV on the Big Five channels. We won't see another series from any of them for four years, and even that's going to be on a regional offshoot. Still, it will be special when we finally get to it, I guarantee it. Before then, we've got some definite wilderness years to go through, as game in TV would be solely found on various digital channels. Some major, some, well, definitely not so major. In the next episode, we're going to be taking a whistle-stop tour through a whole bunch of them, from the bigger likes of Gamesville on Sky, a quick one through the ever-changing Cybernet, some shocking returns for presenters of old, and even an entire gaming channel, or two. It's, well, it's going to be rather curious. In the meantime, fuck off you sad pathetic nerdy geek cunt! Oh, whoops, I meant wherever you are, whoever you be, have a good one, and I'll see you next time.